This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The eighth lecture on spin echo sequences is divided into two parts. Lecture 8a covers basic spin echo signals. The learning objectives for this lecture are to explain the advantages of using a spin echo, to quantitatively describe contrast and signal level of basic spin echo train sequences. These include T1 weighted sequences, T2 weighted sequences, and proton density weighted sequences. And finally, to describe how multiple slices can be interleaved. The motivation for this lecture is that spin echo imaging is the most commonly used method in MRI today. Spin echo sequences offer multiple contrasts and they offer robust imaging as we will show. Let us first look at spin dephasing from static effects and spin echoes. Frequency variations cause a dephasing effect known as T2 prime. Let us look at spin dephasing and spin echoes. Frequency variations from static effects cause dephasing, which is often referred to as T2 prime. This looks like a loss of coherence, and combined with T2 decay, this is referred to as T2 star decay. You see on this gradient echo image a signal dropout due to dephasing near an airspace in the brain. We can refocus the spins to what's called a spin echo, and this will give us a pure T2 contrast. We do this by playing a refocusing RF pulse that flips the spins over. The spins then rephase according to the same frequency variations that cause dephasing, and the result is they come together and form a spin echo. And in the spin echo image, while the contrast is different, you see that the signal shading effects are avoided here. The spin echo has been around since very early on in MRI and was discovered by Erwin Hahn. The basic spin echo pulse sequence looks like this. We have the same waveforms we would have for any gra gradient echo sequence, but we have the addition of a refocusing RF pulse, which is often slice selective in the middle. This pulse occurs halfway from the excitation to the echo time. Let us look more slowly at the formation of a spin echo. Here is the sequence, and here we're using gradients to induce the dephasing effects before and after the refocusing pulse. So we start with magnetization that is at equilibrium. We excite magnetization into the transverse plane. The magnetization is dephased here, in this case by a gradient. The refocusing pulse flips this dephased magnetization. The magnetization then rephases to form a spin echo. So given this sequence, let's think about the parameters that will give us the basic contrast effects. Note that these are no different whether you have a spin echo or not. However, the spin echo is much more commonly used for these sequences. So what we're going to do is fill out this chart based on the choice of the TR and the TE. So at each point, think about what kind of contrast you will get. So the first is a short TR and short TE. And I'll start to put up the answers. So this gives you incomplete recovery, minimal decay, and T1 weighting. Now what if you have a short echo time and a long TR? Now you have full recovery and minimal decay. You avoid both T1 and T2 contrast, so we get what's called proton density weighting, and here's the image. Now if we go to a long echo time and a short TR, this gives us incomplete recovery and signal decay. And this is a mixed contrast, which is not used very much, because as you can see, the contrast in the image is quite flat. And finally, if you have a long TR and a long TE, you get full recovery, but signal decay, and you get T2 weighting. 
and the image looks something like this. So the reason to look at these images, these are all acquired with spin echo sequences. So I want to show the fact that spin echo has a very versatile contrast here. Additionally, keep in mind that the T1 weighted sequence and the T2 weighted sequence are kind of like opposites. For T1 weighting, we have a short repetition time and a short echo time. And for T2 weighting, we have a long repetition time and a long echo time. So let's look at T1 weighted spin echo sequences. Because we have a 90 degree pulse, these are actually quite easy to analyze. Originally, we used a single spin echo for these sequences, and now it's more typical to use a short echo train, which we will see shortly. We use a short repetition time for incomplete T1 recovery, and this results in T1 contrast. Because we use a 90 degree pulse, the signal is actually quite easy to analyze because it is essentially the signal that recovers on one TR based on T1 recovery. We can see an animation of how this forms as shown here. We initially flip the spins and these have two different T1s. They have different amounts of recovery. And what you see is after, a few, after just one tip, the magnetizations will actually reach the same steady state. So they're now already in a steady state where we have the steady state T1 contrast. Now we can also look at the basic spin echo signals. Remember that the 180 degree pulses refocus magnetization to give us a pure T2 decay. So the signal over this decay is equal to the initial signal times e to the minus Te over T2. So if we have a short echo time, there will be very little difference between different T2 tissues, and this gives us a proton density contrast. If we have a long echo time, we will have T2 weighting, where we have contrast based on T2. So you can see in these images, based on different echo times, that you have different amounts of contrast between, for example, the fluid and the muscle and the cartilage here. So this brings us to a second question. In a single spin echo sequence, if we have TR of one second and TE of 50 milliseconds, T1 of two seconds and T2 of 100 milliseconds, can you estimate the signal? So think about this answer and we'll go through the steps here. So first you calculate the T1 weighting. Remember that this is based on the recovery over one repetition. We're actually going to ignore the echo time because the recovery is actually from the echo time to the TR. So we're just going to assume the recovery is over the full TR and this is basically half a T1. So the recovery looks like this. We then calculate the T2 decay and this is now again S0 e to, e to the minus 0.5 because the echo time is exactly half a T2 time. So if we approximate e to the minus one half as 0 0.6, the signal is just 0 0.6 times 0 0.4 times the equilibrium magnetization, or 0 0.24 times this equilibrium magnetization. We can also use multiple spin echoes in what are called spin echo trains. Here we use multiple RF refocusing pulses. And when we do this, we will have multiple spin echoes. And we can use these to obtain images with different contrasts based on the different echo times, or we can combine all of these echoes into a single image and take the image much faster. This is what a spin echo train sequence looks like. Again, we have the excitation, the refocusing pulse, and an echo time, which here is called TE1. And we can simply add additional refocusing pulses which will result in additional spin echoes, as seen here by TE2. Now we will look a little bit at how we combine these. In this animation of a spin echo train, we're going to see how we use multiple spin echoes, but we're going to fill case space in a different order for different contrasts. So we start with excited magnetization, which we refocus and at the spin echo, we will fill different parts of K-space. 
Notice we have multiple lines. We will do this on multiple excitations. We have a second spin echo and we will fill different, a different part of K space. And on the third spin echo, again, we will fill different parts of K space. Okay, and notice in the proton density, we fill from the center out, and in the T2 weighted, we fill from the outside in. So we see here some of the variations from spin echo imaging. Based on the previous slide, you can see how we can vary the contrast. Simply by the order in which we fill K space, we can achieve proton density weighted imaging, where you see the muscle and cartilage are quite bright compared to the fluid pockets in the knee here. And you have T2 weighted imaging where the muscle and cartilage are relatively dark because of T2 contrast. We can also do an extreme case where we acquire an entire image in one echo train. And this is called single shot imaging. It's very useful for imaging in the abdomen and pelvis because there's a lot of random motion there. So you can actually freeze these images. And today we can achieve these reasonable quality images in approximately a quarter to a third of a second or less. Another extreme case is 3D imaging, where we tend to use long echo trains in order to acquire all of the information that we must encode to fill K-space here. So now let's look uh, briefly at interleaving. This is an efficient way to acquire data. So here, it's a simple T1-weighted sequence with a single spin echo. We're just showing how we can image two slices by exciting one slice and then while that slice is recovering, we excite an image as a line from the second slice, and then we go back and acquire a different line from the first slice, and so on. And this is called slice interleaving. Notice that when we have spin echo trains, this may change a little bit. If you have a long repetition time, you can pack quite a lot of slices into that TR time. But depending on the length of your echo train and the length of your TR, which gives you the contrast, you may not be able to fit all your slices. So in the bottom example, we might acquire some of the slices completely and then do what's called a second acquisition to acquire some of the remaining slices. So there's a, there's a bit of an art to how you do this, um, but it really increases the efficiency of sequences so that you can acquire all of the slices at once. And a final comment, uh, concept for this lecture is the idea of prepared sequences, which we will see much more in later lectures. And here, what we're doing is we're doing a fat saturation. This alters the contrast from the other contrast mechanisms we've seen. And then we use the spin echo train readout to form our image. And this is desirable because the spin echo is a very robust way to form the image, but sometimes we want to actually manipulate the contrast further. And there are other examples of contrast preparation that we will see uh, later. So to summarize this lecture, spin echo sequences refocus the T2 prime decay. If we have a short repetition time and a short echo time, we have T1 waiting. If we have a long repetition time and a long echo time, we have T2 waiting. If we have a long repetition and a short echo time, we have proton density waiting. We often interleave multiple slices, but in some cases you won't be able to fit all the slices within a TR, especially for T1 weighted imaging, and therefore you might do a second acquisition. So the next question is how do we calculate spin echo train signals in practice? And for this, uh, please watch the next lecture.